Welcome to his session, key concepts about civic engagement, such as asset mapping and community organizing. Today's presenter is Jason Brewer. For those of you who had already gone to the UTEP live conferences on Engage Like a Boss, you guys are already familiar with him, but just to give you a little bit more insight, Jason Brewer is a native from Chicago, but he has lived in El Paso since 2006, and he has maintained leadership positions in the nonprofit sector for about almost 10 years. And uh, just to give you a little bit more on him, um, Jason does hold a Bachelor of Arts in Mass Communications um, from Midwestern State University. Uh, he advanced um, a certification in social policy at Northwestern University. He does hold a passion for community development. Obviously, he was on the panel for Engage Like a Boss, so he continues to speak on topics of leadership and how important it is to be involved in the community. He is active, um, serving on numerous boards of directors, including the United Way Young Leaders Society, the City of El Paso Empowerment Zone Advisory Board, and the El Paso Chamber of Commerce's Education and of Leadership El Paso. El Paso. And um, at the end of the session, we are going to hand out evaluations because your feedback is important to us, so then you can tell us how great our presentation was and how Jason was very informative mm -hmm. and how you are going to walk out of here like a boss. Okay. Okay. So again, welcome and we hope you enjoy it. Awkward to be introduced by somebody else. You have to kind of sit back and listen to everybody else talk about you and your life and, and what you've done, so it's kind of awkward. You know, those 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 intros are, are great, you know, and it's 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 fun to kind of hear what other people have done, where they've worked, what their experience is, what the most probably the most important thing that was in that is that, you know, I've been in the nonprofit service, community service sector for about ten uh, with camp volunteer time, fifteen to twenty years. And so I I service really resonates with me and I really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you all about civic engagement and, and getting involved in your community and more importantly how one person can actually make a difference and judging by the you have a voice how to stand up and, and speak out uh, like a boss right so um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about that we're going to talk about um, uh, I, when I was writing my um, my little synopsis, um, there was a, if, if you actually look in the program, there was a little bit of what we're going to be talking about today. We may talk a little bit about asset mapping. We may talk about some of those other things that they mentioned. But since we're a small group, I'm totally informal. Um, and so if you have questions, don't feel like you have to wait till the end. Raise your hand. Just jump in. We're we're a small group here, so let's 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 keep it informal and, and let's let's keep it cool. Um, so before I, I go into my presentation, I think it's kind of important to talk a little bit about how I found my way to El Paso. Um, as they mentioned, I've only been here for about, it, it, uh, in fact, I, we had no intention of coming to El Paso. It was kind of an, an odd story on how we got here. My wife's employment actually brought us out here. And uh, she got a, she was having a bad day at our old city in, in Wichita Falls where we were prior to coming here. She was having a bad day at work and on a whim she uploaded her resume to uh, a career builder or one of these sites and a, and a headhunter called. I'm calling from Corpus Christi, Texas. I wanted to talk to you about this, this position that, that we have available. So my wife and I, we get the message, we're like, oh, Corpus Christi. <laughs> Sun, sand, make that work, you know? And, and, uh, and so then there was this miscommunication and he ended up calling back and he was like, oh yeah, sorry about that. Well, the job is in El Paso. They hit us with the old bait and switch. So, and you know, my wife is from Abilene. I'm actually from the Chicago area and I knew really nothing about El Paso. My wife lived seven hours away her entire life and really knew nothing about El Paso. And, and you know, we, we start to think and we, you know, we develop these preconceived notions of what, you know, and everybody's like, oh, it's so far out there. It's, it's dusty and it's dirty and it is really far out here and it is dusty. I, I really like it. So we, we said, okay, you know what, let's, uh, we, we started talking to our friends and family. Like, you know, we have this opportunity. We could go to El Paso. There was like, <laughs> <laughs> opportunity. 
opportunity. <laughs> and and we were like, yeah, I don't know, we've never been, you know. And they were like, they're blowing in El Paso. You know, we've got our governors out there running around talking about bombs are blowing up in El Paso. Blonde hair, blue eyed kids. And we heard all this crazy stuff, <laughs> nonsensical stuff, right? And I still happen to have a blonde hair, blue eyed son. And so my mother in law is like, there is no way in heck that was said. There's no way that you all are moving to El Paso. And she was just vehemently against it. And so we decided to come out here and check it out. <laughs> and so we flew in, and, and unbeknownst to either, kind of bastion out here in West Texas. And so we were really excited that it turned out to be this really beautiful community. And once we got here, we were really surprised to find out that it was really quite a vibrant community. And we were really excited to be here and forgive me, I forgot to get my notes out. Um, and so we, we we really embraced it, and, you know, and it also helps that the first thing that we did once we landed was go to. So that was one of the, the things that really um, uh, attracted us right off, right after we got out of the plane. And so I'll give you a little bit of a background just to kind of sum this whole thing up, you know. When, when I graduated from college, I, I, I left and I went to Guatemala and I was a bum for six months. And I really enjoyed that because it really taught me a lot about how I envisioned myself in the future and, and, and how I interact with communities when I go somewhere, when I travel, or when I meet new people, or I try new things. It really taught me to embrace change and embrace the unknown. Because, you know, when I went to Guatemala, I didn't speak Spanish. Uh, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I didn't have any money. I didn't have a job. My mom, two months, and so I was kind of missing in action. But it, it really taught me how to become self-sufficient, how to figure out what was really going on. And so that really has shaped the way that my wife and I interact with new things, new communities, etc. And so the, one of the first things after L and J that we did is we started walking around different parts of the community. In the body or the path. We everywhere that people told us not to go, we went. We went to Wadis. People were like, oh my god, you went to Wadis. It was cool. Kentucky clubs off the hook. But enough of all that. But so communities at a at a deeper level, not just the superficial, oh, this is a great city, I'm happy to live here. No, a deeper, I feel this city, I appreciate this city. And so it really taught us a lot of great things. So today we're going to talk about several things. We're going to talk about community engagement and community empowerment. How to engage with a community and how to inspire others and empower others to engage in their community. And so I'm going to actually reverse engineer this. And so we're going to talk about some definitions. We're going to talk about the definition of community. Um, but I want to talk about engagement and empowerment first and foremost because that's ultimately why we're here. Engagement is... Um, it actually has, you can see the definition, to occupy the attention or efforts of a person or persons to bind as, uh, as my pledge, promise, contract, or oath, uh, make liable. Um, we're going to talk more in depth about this in just a few minutes, but I just wanted you to see these definitions and, and then power um, to enable, to permit, to give power to, to promote individual self-assurance, um, to produce, produce a desired outcome. This is the one that I really want to spend a lot of time on because I have a, you all are smart, you're in college, you probably have a pretty good understanding of what empowerment means and engagement means. Community often gets a little bit fuzzy. Not necessarily that you don't know what it means, but it has a lot of things. A social group of any size whose members reside in a specific locality, share government, and often have a common cultural and historical heritage. A social, religious, occupational, or other group sharing common characteristics or interests from the larger society within which it exists. That is a mouthful. So let's actually talk about what community is. El Paso, we, we know that this is a community. When we think about the word community, a lot of us think of the community in which we live in, which is this great city of El Paso. Break it down even further. Um, your, your community could be the neighborhood in which you reside, the Segundo Barrio, for instance. Or us on campus here. We all are a community, a community of students, a community of folks that are coming together to pursue our academic. And then there's these guys. <laughs> Maybe know about furries? So furries are people that dress in costumes. Um, they, and, and actually there's, there's, there's even subpopulations and subcommunities within the furry community. 
But let me just kind of hit, hit the, uh, the broad level. These are folks that, um, grown ass adults that like variety or the other. Um, they usually get together in conventions, they usually have um, websites, they usually have email listservs, um, they usually make their own costumes. In fact, I know one guy who is a furry, and this isn't something that I got off of the internet, this is actual photo that I took myself. But this gentleman, um, right here, um, his, his costume, if you actually look at it, it's a female costume. It's great. I'm proud of him. But <laughs> the interesting thing about it, he made that costume. This guy's 26, 27, there's nothing but two, two main rifts in, in, the, in the furry population. There's the, 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 the traditional furry folks that go and they, they go to conventions and they, they meet up with each other on, on certain occasions and all these other things. And then there's a secondary group of furries that, well, I'm not going to talk about it. It's of an interesting variety and they usually do it in hotel rooms and all kinds of crazy stuff, but <laughs> that's not my point. My point is, is that this is a community. A community could be anything. A group of like minds coming together with a shared vision, a shared goal, a shared um, idea of what normal is. That's normal. So that's a community. And so I just wanted to give you that to put everything that we're going to talk about going forward into perspective. A community could be anything. And there's multiple different ways to engage with different types of communities. There's all kinds of different things that vary within the communities, but the underlying thing that binds all of these communities together is that common sense that like-minded people with a common goal, a common vision, a common culture want to come together and be furry together, <laughs> right? So let's talk a little bit about our, and forgive me here because I am the new guy, but the couple things that you should know about me before we go forward. I love history. Um, I'm, I'm a super dork. I love to just read anything historical that I can get my hands on. I'm just fascinated by it. Um, the second thing is, is that, and this is really just more in general about my presentation as a whole. I'm, I am from Illinois. Um, I, we, by nature, have a tendency to talk fast. Um, and then on top of that, I'm super passionate tendency to talk even faster, and then I get louder, and then I start to ramble, and then I start to just get crazy. And so if I ever get crazy, like this guy's about to do, he's going to say, dude, slow down. <laughs> so just let me know that I'm, I, I'm getting a little crazy. Yes, sir? Literally, uh, you just mentioned that you graduated and you are from Illinois. Uh, which university did you attend? Um, I actually went to Mid. I went back for uh, my advanced accreditation at Northwestern. Also. And, and it's in Chicago. Um, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our community. We started out, and many of you all know the history, the history of El Paso. I'm assuming that you all are, for the most part, here from here. But you know that the railroad is really what drove our community forward. It brought in so many different populations. It brought in the migrant populations from South America and Central America and Mexico. It brought in, it brought in a large African American population. Um, and they all converged in this one little area to connect the railroads to bring our country together. And so we started early on with this really rich, vibrant culture. And it truly was a melting pot, everybody coming together for a common goal of uniting the two coasts in the middle with a common passage. History in this community. Sunbolt, three tenths of a mile that way. Yeah, that way, you're right, that way. Uh, the second oldest bowl game in the nation, only second to the Rose Bowl. Pretty awesome, huh? It's amazing, that kind of history that we have. And in fact, the first game was played in 1935. First bowl game. Mills building, Anson Mills building from downtown. That looks familiar? You folks don't know this, but we in El Paso, we started out as this hub of innovation. We were the place that folks looked to. If we were going to do something awesome in the world, let's look to see how El Paso is doing it. The Mills Building in 1912, this 12-story concrete building was skyscraper. Largest building in the state of Texas. Largest building in the United States. Largest building in the world. Largest concrete structure. El Paso, Texas, 1912. Who'd have thought? We were this hub of innovation. The concrete, um, and in fact, a you know, um, team of architects, the Trost brothers, that actually have designed five of our big buildings downtown. 
This is one of them. And in fact, this is the one that put them on the map. Um, and so we were doing amazing things. Many of you all probably know this story. Conrad Hilton built his first skyscraper hotel right here. It's the plaza downtown. It's the third largest hotel in the state, in the nation, in the world, again. And so he understood that this was a place where folks were coming together and they were doing big things. He recognized that early on and built this. Continental Airlines, a lot of folks, started here in 1934. They operated for five years um, as, as the Barney Speed Airlines. And then in 1939, it's like, you know, this is awesome. There are very few airlines anywhere, commercial airlines anywhere. And we're doing it. And we're flying international flight. We need to change our name. They became Continental Airlines. Started right here in El Paso. Who knew, right? A hub of innovation. People recognize the potential that we as people to make change in the world. To say, I want to build the biggest building, not only in El Paso, not only in Texas, but in the world. I want to have the largest airline that is not just flying from here to Odessa. We're flying internationally. We're continental. Innovation. People recognize that this was a place that big things were going to happen. So I know you're looking at it like, oh, here we go with the history lecture. <laughs> I wanted to be in history class, I would. Oh, so what's my point? I do have a point. Somewhere after World War II, we decided that we needed to change our strategy. We took a big hit with the Great Depression, um, as the rest of the nation did. It's what you do once you take that hit that defines your character. It's not about how many times you fall down. It's about how many times you stand up. Well, for a while there, we didn't stand up. We became a hub of innovation again. Don't get me wrong. Innovative. We defined, and I, I forgot my picture. I realized I don't have it now because I was going to go hit the button, and this really awesome picture of a sarco would come up. We defined how clothing was put together. We defined what fashion looked like. Not necessarily how it was designed, but how it was built, how it was manufactured, how it of innovation once again. Unfortunately, we became a hub for low-wage jobs. All of this big thinking that we did early on, our world-renowned architecture, our continental airlines, our big thinking kind of went by the wayside because we realized that we could do a lot of things. We weren't thinking big. We were thinking about how we could maintain. How could we keep the status quo the way that it is? Because it was safe. It was safe. Everybody in the country was recovering from this massive depression. Two major world wars. Another one looming in Korea. And so we, 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 we played it safe. Unfortunately, we have been in that mindset for a long time. And it's only recently that we've started to think about what that's done to move forward. So look, everybody had an opinion about the ballpark, or everybody had an opinion about propositions one, two, and three. And we're gonna talk about those in just a second. Are y'all timing me, or am I on my own? It's like, dude, slow down, stop. We're just gonna maintain, instead of be innovative and push the envelope, we're just gonna be a lot of things started happening to the detriment of our community. We live in a time right now where one in four of our children right here in El Paso will not graduate from high school. And so I'm also kind of, I'm big into history, but I'm also real big into data. Um, I, I actually, and all this other kind of geeky stuff, and I won't bore you with that, but I'm going to hit you with several statistics here. Now don't be afraid, there's no quiz. <laughs> Maybe not. But. <laughs> I, I do want you to kind of think about these things. You don't have to remember them, but I guarantee you they will still graduate high school. Think about the implications of that. If we want to be that hub of innovation again, if we want to get back to that spot where we are thinking big, 
thinking grand, thinking outside of the box, thinking about how we can lead our community in the next generation, it's not going to happen when one in four kids aren't graduating from high school. There's another statistic that, because it really plays directly into this. Right now, 26% of the children um, ages 16 to 21, I say children, but young people, 26% uh, of young people in El Paso County between the ages of 16 and 21 aren't in school and they're not employed. The percent is 47,000 kids. 47,000 kids between the ages of 16 and 21 that are just out there floating. Think about that. We also realize that poverty is a major issue. Um, that's probably no surprise. You all have been in El Paso, you've driven around, you've seen that we are an impoverished median income. Anybody have a clue of what the median income for the United States is? Let me back up. Median income, some guy in a suit and tie somewhere in a big office in probably Washington, D.C. has said, okay, let's do an average of what it would take to live in a community based on a family of four. And we'll call that a median income. So, <clears throat> what is it? 53. 53. Um, it's actually 52 and some change, but I don't know what the change is, so I'm going to call it 53. Uh, state of Texas, any guess? 47. El Paso, 36. So you can see, yes, we're already right there, but the with census, and census has always been great, but now they're doing really cool things where they're breaking census down into census block groups, which is even smaller clusters of groups. And so within El Paso County, I think there's 136 census blocks. But if you take that same information of the median income and you break that down by, say, the Lower Valley, for instance, it's about 17,000 for the median income. The Chamizal, about 13,000. The Suelo Barrio, about 11,000. The Chihuahuita neighborhood, about 9,000. Family of four. That's food, <coughs> clothing, shelter, everything that you need to survive, the essentials. Now, the median income was a little, they, they didn't measure it the same way back around that same time, but they actually have a conversion. So they can tell you what the median income is now versus what it would have been in that particular time. The median income back pre-1930, when we had this hub of innovation in our community, would have been about 65. Based off of inflation, today's numbers versus the other, I mean, it's, it's probably not exactly apples to, to apples. Um, it may be... Granny Smith to whatever the, the, the red delicious apple, right? They're still apples, but maybe a little different. But it gives you a pretty good indication of what it is that we're looking at, right? So you can see that as a result of our thinking, a critical shift has occurred. We went from this hub of innovation, this amazing community that was doing these big things, and the people <coughs> were living large. And then the Depression hit, and then some of these other things happened, and then everything started going west. And that's when Tucson, uh, Phoenix, um, those, Albuquerque, that's when those cities really blew up. But we maintained the status quo. And in fact, we ramped up the garment industry. We ramped up silver and copper smelting. All of those keeping low, low wages here in this community. And that's taken its toll over time. Yon yon. The heliotropic principle. Um, what this is, is we don't really have, and I've noticed this since I've been here, we don't really have many sunflowers in El Paso. But if anybody has ever really seen a sunflower or spent any time looking at it, you can tell at any point during the day where the sun is in the sky by looking at a sunflower. They will always, living beings gravitate towards their life force. So let's apply that to what we're talking about now. If we're constantly talking about how bad things are, constantly talking about how um, we have low, low wage jobs, if we're constantly talking all these negative things, what's going to start to happen? We're going to start to believe it. Educational attainment. And if we keep talking about that, and if we keep feeding energy into that, it's going to perpetuate that cycle. So, in the, in the intro, they talked a little bit about an asset-based approach to community development. Asset-based versus a deficit-based. Deficit is constantly looking at, this is all the way that our community is bad. bad. Asset-based is, okay, sure, there's challenges. We have to identify them because we have to know what we're attacking. 
but let's look at the resources that we already have in place. Let's look at what has worked well and look at what strategies we can put together with what we already have. That's the asset-based approach. It's looking on the positive side and looking, making lemonade out of lemons, right? You all have heard that, right? That is what the asset-based approach is. The heliotropic principle states that if we continuously pump negativity in our community, continuously uh, uh, hold ourselves back, we're going to do just that. We're going to get left behind. But if we start talking about all the things that we do have in our start to make some change. Okay, do that. I have an assistant. Yeah. All right. So, what can we do about it? So this is going to be the more practical side of, 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 of the conversation today. We're going to talk a little bit about what can we do with what we already have. Some of these are going to be completely basic. But when I tell you how we're actually utilizing, you're going to be like, So what can I do about it? All right, everybody's going to say, okay, let's get out and vote. So we, we, that was a big deal. If you're on the Facebook like I am, everybody and their mom was talking about it. Vote yes, vote no. We want a ballpark. Paul Foster's stealing everybody's money. I don't care what side of the argument you're on. Just have a voice. And a lot of people did. A lot of people were talking one way or the other. But, but what actually happened on election, something about it. We talked all kinds of mess, all kinds of big game. Yeah. Vote. Vote, people. It's easy. All you have to do is register. All you have to do is go in and say, hey, look, I am in 30 people out there that are against everything that I stand for. My one vote is not going to make a difference. It's not true. Your one vote, more importantly, what you need to do is you need to find other people that share your view. It's not always about who has the best thing to say, unfortunately. It's about who's the loudest. And that's not always the best scenario, but it is what it is. So voting, I'm, I've, I've done this presentation uh, a couple times now and I actually did it a lot leading up to the election. So I'm not going to bore you with this. You know, if you want to go, if you want to be out there, you can go to elpasocounty.com slash elections. You can fill out the, uh, the voter registration form there. They can tell you where to drop it off. They can, you can submit it online, all that stuff. So I'm not going to bore you with this. I'm not really going to spend a lot of time, but I'm just going to say, if you want, if you have an opinion, got a voice. This is one development and then even more specifically, um, individualized community development. So looking at the neighborhood level, working with people within your immediate surrounding, your friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, etc. Folks that you see on a daily basis, important to me. I do this presentation a lot, and I always do the show of hands. I, I won't subject y'all to this, but if you, if you look at the two people next to you, two people across the street, most people know one of those four. We used to have societies where we would sit out and we knew them by name, we knew their kids, we knew what color of the underwear you know, the, 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 the wife was wearing. I mean, all kinds of <laughs> crazy stuff. But we knew because we had conversations. We talked to our neighbors. So I, I put this up here just because, you know, I, I think it's kind of a creepy picture, actually. But, I, but, you know, but the neighborhood watch, that is one of these things that... Um, so I, I'm from Chicago, and... and um, more specifically, I'm from South Chicago, um, and it actually has the nickname of the Black Belt, not because people crime. Well, yeah, they do kind of do come to, but unofficially. Um, but they're high crime, um, a, a huge African American uh, contingency. But um, and it was a really, really rough area. But when I was growing up, we had a lot of folks that were really interested in seeing that change. I grew up um, in in the Chicago area from '79 um, to. 85, 86 when I was young, when I lived in that neighborhood. And so it was really kind of right at the prime of the community development, the asset-based community development phase, where people were really getting out there and trying to get to know your neighbors, get to know, find community leaders, um, and then giving, and when working with agencies to give them tools to, 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 to create these leaders and leaders and cultivate them, so that way they can go out and recruit their friends, their neighbors, and we can start this whole big kumbaya community revitalization thing. Well, it, it worked. Because people made time to meet your neighbor, to meet the people across the street. Hey, man, I'm going out of town. Will you 
watch my basic conversations with people that are in your immediate surroundings goes a long way. Now, granted, that didn't always work because you said, hey, we well, going downtown and you watch my deal. Oh, well, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm breaking your house. But, <laughs> And, you know, but whatever. But I mean, it's it's all about getting out and starting to talk and having conversations within the city government. Um, actually, more specifically, within the community development part of our city government, that is called neighborhood services, and they are very very active. And so, if you live in a neighborhood, there's a very good possibility that you have a neighborhood organization. Uh, uh, actually, it's not too far. I am a part of a, a neighborhood association, the Mission Hills Neighborhood Association. And so this is a group of folks that come together and they, they, it kind of gets a bad rap because you know you have a couple of the older guys that are really overzealous. That guy painted his house three different colors and it's not acceptable. But, and you're always gonna have your old yahoos like that. But because we have come together and we have elected people to represent us, we have a unifying voice that can go directly to neighborhood services at the city. And if we've got an issue, we've got a friend at City Hall because we're organized. See, advocacy and speaking up is kind of a lot like donating money, right? In fact, I don't have my hat, I'd pass it around, but <laughs> you may give a dollar, you may give a dollar, you may give a dollar, five, ten, you know, and it's great. Your one dollar is may, maybe, maybe all you can do. May not be a lot, but coupled with hers and hers and his and his. See, and speaking out works much the same way. If you start talking about, hey, did you know that one in four kids in El Paso won't graduate from high school? Did you know that one in three people in El Paso are living in poverty? Together, we start to raise that collective awareness. And all of our voices speaking together in chorus are much louder than if any one person is just that. It's identifying other people that have a common goal, a common vision and figuring out how we can work together, leverage all of our resources to have a much louder voice. Old codgers. <laughs> but what's really great is that they're a bunch of loud old codgers. They go down to City Hall, they get stuff done. They didn't pick up our trash, oh hell no. <laughs> I'm gonna get somebody. <laughs> so, um, you can actually go, the, the city of El Paso is revamping their website right now, and so it's a, it's a total mess. But in Neighborhood Services, City of El Paso, um, you will find this link and you will get there. They are a great resource because not only can they help you with if you didn't get your trash picked up, but they can also tell you who is representing your neighborhood. It's nobody. It's an opportunity for you to use your voice. You don't have to be a homeowner. You don't have to own that home. You would be renting it. It could be a flop house that you've been living on the couch for six weeks. But you reside there. You have a voice. That's yours. So I highly recommend just looking to see what they have. Look at where you live to see if there's a neighborhood association already in existence. And if so, reach out. I just want to get to know who you are. Hi, I'm Bob. This is a big one. Uh, I, I also, what we didn't talk about is that I work for a nonprofit organization called Nation for Highly Vulnerable Populations. Um, so our, our primary client is a 32-year-old mother, single mother of three young children, um, has a very limited command of the English language, lives in poverty, and is not employed. That is our typical client. We have about 2,000 of them right now across El Paso. We are in 21 different schools, and so what we do is we focus on education from a multi-generational approach. One, we educate young children by providing them high quality. We bring the mothers in, parents, but I traditionally say mother because 96% of the folks that we see are women. And so we bring the mothers into the second classroom, and there we're doing parenting. English is the second language, general education diploma. We're empowering them to go on and pursue their education. So I work in nonprofits, so I understand the importance. You know, and right now we live in a time where nonprofits are trying to do so much more with so much less. Just last year alone, if you look at the cuts that were made to education, EPISD last year alone lost $39 million just from state budget shortfalls. We didn't have enough money at the state level to continue paying you as much as we've been paying you. So we're going to cut EPISD $39 million. YISD, they cut them $26 million. San Eli ISD got cut $112 million. 
schools are very similar to the situation as nonprofits because us as nonprofits, we get a lot of our funding from the state, from schools, from donors themselves. When times are hard, people kind of hang on to their pocketbooks a little bit more. And so, but volunteering is a great opportunity to A, get involved, to find out what's really happening in your neighborhood. B, find out what people actually care about. C, you might find something that you actually care about. And D, it's a great opportunity to network and to meet people, directors. And nonprofits like people with influence on their boards of directors. Maybe not financial influence, but people they know. I used to work for an organization called the United Way. And we had one Dr. Nacolicio on our board. So you can see, people of influence make a difference. And so, if you get involved with a nonprofit, chances are you're going to meet their board of directors. Chances you're going to find a nonprofit that is resonating, that resonates to you based off of what it is that you're interested in. There's lots of ways to volunteer right here on your own campus. Most of you all probably know about it, but I need to tell you anyway because Azuri would kick me if I didn't. <laughs> the Center for Civic Engagement, there's their website. You can just do a Google search or you can do a search right from your own website at UTEP. Um, but you don't even have to do anything. You just have to go there and talk opportunities there are to engage with nonprofit organizations, with schools. Whatever it is that you're interested in, I guarantee you there's somebody out there doing it. That's a great resource to connect with that person. Another one, um, it's a website, it's an online. Um, I know you kids are all into the internet these days, <laughs> the interwebs. And, um, but what you can do, you can go to this volunteerelpaso.org, you can fill out a literally two-page profile, your name, email, phone number, what is it that you're interested in? I'm interested in animals. I like pink fluffy poodles. So I'm sure somebody knows. <laughs> you can go and you can put your interest level in there, whatever it is you're interested in. How often do you want to volunteer? Maybe once a month, maybe once a week. Hell, if you're feeling it, you can do it every day. But you can set those parameters and it will send you via email different opportunities that align with your passion, your desire, your interest, etc. Nonprofits need your help right now. And it's a great opportunity to get involved. And especially if you are in a field, social worker, nursing, or anything like that, really any kind of field, there's probably a nonprofit men finding out who is doing that. Because, hey, if nothing else, once you graduate, you might want a job. And I found my way into the nonprofit field and in the career field that I've been in for about 12 years now through volunteering. Position opened up. Hey, you've been here for a while. You know the ropes. <laughs> who are my elected officials? You'd be amazed at how many people have no clue who represents them. A lot of folks have no idea. But it's super easy to find out. And especially in a community like El Paso. And that's why I really like El Paso is because the ease of access to key decision makers and key leaders in this community. I've only been here for two years. And one of the first things that I did once I got here is I just figured out who were the movers and shakers. I simply Googled who were my elected officials. And it pulled up a number of sites. So I wanted to find out who is in charge of the city. Easy to find out. And you don't have to write these down. I'm actually going to pass around a sheet. Um, if you would like, just put your name and email, and I'll email this, uh, these slides to you, so that way you can just click on the let out earlier. Um, uh, but, but it's really important just to get your name out there, and figure out who is making the decisions, who, is the one, who are the ones that are calling the shots, who are the decision makers, who are the key people. And the great thing about El Paso is that they're very receptive, very open, El quite honest with you. And people are very down to earth. One of the first people that I spoke to once I got here was Sylvester Reyes. I called him up. He wasn't. Uh, he, he was in town. I was like, "Hey, I'm new in town. Um, I've been in nonprofit. I want to really talk to you about what you feel is the biggest challenges facing our community. But more importantly, what are the biggest areas of potential that we have?" He said, "Hey, come on in. I've got 30 minutes. We spent 45. He was late to his next meeting." because he was enjoying talking about this community. That's the thing. A lot of the folks that are key leaders in this community are from El Paso. And since this is the biggest small town that I have ever been in, it has that small town mentality where you can't take a dump without somebody knowing about it in this town. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was so vulgar. I'm sorry. My 
45 minute conversation with him, I knew so much more than I did prior to coming into it. And they like talking about it. And their politicians and elected officials are kind of fooling themselves anyway. And so you're giving them a microphone and a platform to stand for you to learn what's really happening. Business leaders are exactly the same way. They're at the top of their game in whatever field they're in. So if you're interested in engineering, if you're interested in avionics or electronics, go to the chamber, El Paso Chamber of Commerce. Um, you, what businesses are, are represented by both of those chambers, and then they give phone numbers and contact information for people to just talk to. If you're interested in working in one of these fields, find out what it takes to do it. The other thing, and I, I, I'm full of these, these sayings and these cliches or whatever, but one of my favorite things and my mantra that I live by is fake it till you make it. Right? Go and talk to them. I'm going to read on the internet. I'm going to get a book about it. I'm going to fake it till I make it. So if you want to be in electronics or if you want to be an engineer, sit down and talk to engineers. You've got to find them. Though. Do a petition. There's lots of, you, you probably saw them come election time. This is kind of a, one of those election slides, but everybody and their mom was doing a petition. Do this kind of big pie in the sky petition. Stop three like it does from roaming the streets. <laughs> Make a petition about it. But if you want to do something local, if you have an issue that you're really interested about, right there. Type in a little bit of information, online services. It'll print you out a deal. All you have to do is get the required amount of signatures. But if you think about it, this goes back to what we initially talked about, finding that community. Who is, has those same interests as you? And then bringing them all together. I am super interested in dressing up in a dog suit and walking to Walmart. But if I started walking to Walmart, somebody's going to drive down the road and say, this guy's wearing a dog suit. I've got a cat suit. Community right there. That's how it happens. You have to put yourself out there. All of you kids in your social media. And in fact, I need to uh, take a picture of all of you also. I have to tweet it. But, um, but everybody has a platform. And this is key. You're louder than you think. I have 30 followers on my Twitter. Measly old 2,600 friends on Facebook. <laughs> but, just saying. Fix up, there it is. That is sexy. All right, cool. So, you have a platform. If you have an interest, I guarantee if you put it up there, somebody's gonna like it. And if they like it, boom, I got a friend. And if I want to know something else, I'm going to put something else up there. And if they like it twice, I got a double friend. And then I'm going to really engage with that person. This, maybe he's into, I don't know, some, some other weird stuff. I'm going to find that out. But you're putting yourself out there. You have a platform now. Use it. And people did during the election. They really did. But there was a lot of this going on. There was a lot of pissing and moaning about, oh, I don't want a ballpark then. Yeah. I don't want them to tear down City Hall. Great. But don't whine about it. I challenge you, if you're going to do this, great. Proud of you. Don't do that. You've got a big platform. It's all about using it. And it's all about using it correctly and leveraging the power of your 2600 Facebook fans <laughs> to your advantage. Because you know, not everybody's going to pick up on your message. Not everybody's going to, it's not going to resonate. Look at it like advertising. For so long, advertising was designed to interrupt people from what it is that they're doing. I'm watching The Bachelor. It's the rose ceremony. Who's he going to give the rose to? Oh, commercial! Ah! You know, so that's, that was their whole goal. Is they want to interrupt whatever it is that you're doing, and they're going to push their message on you, push their agenda. The, 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 but what you've got to do is you've got to go where people are at. If you're into furries, I'm sure there's a furry Facebook group. If not, start one. And you, I guarantee you will probably do it. Uh, Facebook.com slash EP furries. That's my site. <laughs> I guarantee you will find somebody to follow you. At that point, you have taken the first steps to developing a community. And then what you do with that community you have to nurture it. You have to feed it. You have to give it food. And when you develop it, 
you get three followers, four followers, 15, 2,600. You will have a group of folks that support you. All right, I've got, I've got an exercise for you, okay? Raise your hand. Raise them up. Raise them up. Hi, as you can. I am an orange shirt. What's your name? Clarissa. That was weak. You're all. I'm all you hey. no. A little higher. See? Everybody <laughs> can do more. We, for a long time, were the society where we had our hands way up there. And then we just raised it for a long time. I need to raise it higher. Turn to your neighbor. Give him one of these. Pow! Oh, yes, oh, see? <laughs> you know what you all just did? Two things. One, you all had your hands in the air. And when you turned to your neighbor, you nurtured that community. And then you turned probably to even a third neighbor. You took that community one step further. You're building bridges. In El Paso, it's no different. It's all about raising your hand. So when I put on my dog suit and I walk to Walmart, I got my hand held high. So who watches Saturday Night Live? Right? So you know at the very beginning when they're, when they're going down, they're doing all, oh, so-and-so, Keenan, whatever it's like. Community. They just made a connection. That's what it takes. You have to reach out. You have to stand up for what it is that you believe in. I want to be a hub of innovation. I want to change the world. <coughs> And if somebody else sticks their hand up, just built a community. Leadership and change is just like that. Change isn't top down. Change doesn't start with some guy sitting in Washington saying, this is what it is, this is how it's going to be. That's how it's often perceived. But change happens from the bottom up. People coming together for a common goal, a common good, uniting under people, supporting their base, they start to rise. That's how change happens. It's not top down, it's bottom up. It's not throwing money or power. It's leadership. Leadership is change. People want change. People want to don their furry suit. They don't want to be the first one though. I guarantee you there's somebody else on this campus who has a dog suit. You want to put it on the minute that I put mine on? Oh snap. Let me go get my dog suit. People want change. They just need somebody to lead that change. You all are leaders. Thank you all so much. All right, that's me and you. Um, I actually have kind of put it into a, because these are just a bunch of pictures, a bunch of slides, and so if you were just looking at this, like, man, this guy likes weird photos. But, um, I've actually compiled all of those links into just kind of a one-pager, and so I'll email all that to you all. Thank you so much.